Welcome, everyone. We're really excited to be here today to share a lot of things with you and to talk to you, allow you to speak as well. And we have our panelists here today with us that will share a lot about their members and what uh, types of barriers and recommendations they are suggesting to the government. Um, I'd like to give a special welcome to the people who are joining us today. Uh, we're a live webcast this morning from Sydney, British Columbia, and we're happy that we can also have people from coast to coast joining us today. My name is Christiane Schofield. I'm the project manager for the Spotlight Project, and I'll be facilitating our conversation here today. And before we officially start today's discussion, I'd like to take this time to recognize and sincerely thank the Coast Salish people whose territories we are meeting on today. As many of you may know, the Spotlight Project is funded by the Government of Canada's Social Development Partnerships Program, Disability Component. It is a joint venture of CHA and over 20 partners, created to provide recommendations to the federal government around creating accessibility legislation. Through consultations, surveys, and webinars, phase one of the Spotlight Project gathered thoughts and experiences from Canadians with invisible disabilities, which culminated in a report to the federal government in March. An abridged version of this report is available here for you today. And it's also available for those listening in online. It's in the Resource Centre on the web webcast interface found at the bottom left hand of your screen. Our conversation today will build on what we've already done as a broad community by digging deeper into how the federal government can specifically address accessibility for people with invisible disabilities. This digging deeper is the focus of phase two of the Spotlight Project. We'll take some time to talk to our Spotlight Project advisory committee members seated up here at the front to hear about their priorities and how, for their members, the federal government can fill the accessibility gap. One quick housekeeping note for those of you following along online. If you're having technical difficulties at any time, please let us know through, through the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. Our technical assistants will be happy to help you. As well, if you have any questions for our panelists during the presentations, feel free to submit them through the Q&A box as well. Now, before we get to our panelists, I'd like to invite Lauren McDonald, President of the Board of Directors for CHA, to say a few words. Great. Good morning. Thank you, Christiane. And good morning. Welcome to everyone. And we have a great day ahead of us here in Sydney. I also see there's going to be some great weather outside. And so I want to take a, just a few moments to welcome you to the Spotlight Project event. So I'm going to talk briefly about the project, both about our role at the Canadian Hard of Hearing Association and set the stage for the panel discussion that you'll be hearing this morning. So as you may know, the federal government has been holding public consultations across the country and wanting to hear from Canadians with disabilities how the, the federal government, the Government of Canada, can improve accessibility and inclusion for people living with disabilities. This involves both developing the federal accessibility legislation and developing programs to shift Canada towards a more inclusive society. They are hoping to wrap up the consultations by next year and move forward with developing legislation and other initiatives around promoting inclusion. So the Canadian Hard of Hearing Association was very keen to participate and play a leadership role 
and these federal accessibility consultations. We saw an opportunity to work with partners from across Canada to develop clear recommendations to the federal government around developing accessibility legislation. And so together with 20 other organizations, we developed the Spotlight Project on Invisible Disabilities. So my hope, which is chaired by Shaw and its partner organizations, is that the Spotlight Project will achieve a few things. One, give Canadians with invisible disabilities an important opportunity to shape legislation. Directly communicate challenges to the federal government. Provide clear and concrete recommendations to the federal government around the members' concerns. And finally, most exciting, is to strengthen the connection with our partner organization so it, we do have a true collaboration. This is ambitious, make no mistake. We realize that. But I am confident that the Spotlight Project contribution will provide the federal government with clear, concrete recommendations for moving forward to address Canada's accessibility gap. Phase one of the project was held from November of 2016 to March of 2017 through webinars, <coughs> a comprehensive survey, and in-person consultation. We gathered information from our members around the challenges they faced during three times of transition. The first, high school to university and then university to the workforce. The second, military to civilian life. The third, workforce to, win to retirement. We collected all of this information and collated it into the Spotlight Project Phase 1 report. Now we are turning to Phase 2. And I neglected to mention, with those three transition points, we also have the overarching theme of mental health for Canadians living with disabilities. I want to make sure that our partner from the Canadian Mental Health Association <coughs> is recognized as being a valuable key to that piece. In phase two, where we are now, the federal government is asking funded partners to develop recommended text for the federal legislation, a draft of which will be completed by the fall of 2017. They are also asking partners to develop concrete recommendations, benchmarks, and measurable <coughs> outcomes for potential federal programs aimed at addressing the accessibility gap across Canada. So as we move through phase two, the Spotlight Project will focus on laying out those concrete, specific recommendations for the federal government. Again, this is ambitious. We know this. We have a lot to cover, a lot of information to collect. I am confident that together we can provide the federal government with the recommendations they seek as well as a clear path forward. This is a unique opportunity for CHA to feed directly into the federal government legislation and the regulations. It's very exciting to have that potential impact. Thus far, it's been a success, and I'm looking forward to being part of the process as it moves along. I will leave, leave my remarks there, <coughs> and but I want to reiterate that I am so thrilled to have all of you here today. I know some of you are not morning people and have traveled far to get here, so thank you for being here. As well, I'm delighted that our Spotlight Project Advisory Committee members are joining us, and I look forward to the dialogue that we're going to have today. Thank you.
and I am happy to talk with you after this uh, today's session if you'd like more information. Now I think Christiane is coming back up. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Lauren. We're now going to turn to our panel discussion. And uh, our panel today is comprised of the members of the Advisory Committee of the Spotlight Project. And we're delighted that they could join us here today. As I mentioned earlier, our goal here today is to build on the work we've already done through phase one. And we want, to, we want to continue developing concrete steps for the federal government can take to address accessibility gaps. This is the focus of phase two of the Spotlight Project. So today, we're going to take a look at some of the recommendations in the phase one report and how the federal government can implement them. We'll also talk about what impacts these recommendations would have if they were put into practice. To set the stage for this conversation, I'd like to ask our panelists to talk briefly about their organization, who they represent, and why they decided to be part of the Spotlight Project. And we will start with a brief uh, remark from Lauren on that as she just came off the podium, but if you could, Lauren, just on behalf of the members. Sorry, just checking that this was on, and I'll be very, very brief because all of you are presumably members of the Canadian Hard of Hearing Association, and it was really exciting to see this project come to life. It was an idea that was born out of attendance at the Hearing Loss Association of America conference last June in Washington. And I was privileged to attend. And it was by listening to our American counterparts and what they were doing that I started to see that we could take some of those good ideas and bring them to Canada for the federal government to consider. And so with that, we came up with the transition period because in my view, hearing loss is really a cradle to grave idea that we need to be there for everyone and we were able to identify the partners that we wanted to work with us across all areas of uh, Canadian life with respect to invisible disabilities. We all know that hearing loss is an invisible disability but there's more that uh, are also sharing that experience. And with that, I won't say much more. It's that uh, we're, we're pleased with how this is rolling out, with the partners that we have at our table on the advisory panel who are exceptional in their own right, as well as the collaborative partners that we have. So with that, I will stop and just say that uh, the partners will then, in turn, introduce you to their own organization, and then we can continue. Thanks, Lauren. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. I'm Ray McGinnis. I'm a retired Chief Warrant Officer. Uh, I served in the Canadian Forces for almost 34 years, and I retired in uh, 2010. Throughout my military career, I've had the distinct uh, pleasure to serve with all three environments, Air Force, Army, and the Navy. The last eight years of my career, I spent writing family policy on deployment support, mental health, and family violence issues. On the 15th of April, 2011, I made a career change. I joined the Royal Canadian Legion Service Bureau as a service officer. Our mission is to serve veterans, which includes serving military and RCMP members and their families, to promote remembrance and to serve our communities and our country. We have more than 275,000 members and over 1,400 branches. We receive no government funding. You don't, do not have to be a Legion member to receive our services. As long as you've worn a uniform or wear a uniform for this country, we provide our services free. We have been providing these services since 1926. We are mandated in legislation to assist veterans, and we have the right to review all of their medical and service records. 
Veterans Affairs Canada records and all material required to assist a veteran in their application. Our Dominion Command and the command service officers across the country have access to secure, secure computer systems to help veterans and their families with disability claims or appeals upon written authorization from the veteran. For our veterans and their families who are not entitled to claim a benefit from Veterans Affairs Canada and are in financial need, we provide benevolent funding to purchase their hearing aids. In 2015, we provided $17.5 million in benevolent funding to our veterans and their families through our Poppy Trust Fund for a variety of requests. The need may be for shelter, food, prescription medicine, or medical appliances, among other needs. The benefit of being part of the Spotlight Project is to further our message on eradicating the stigma around mental illness and closing the gap for our serving members as they transition from military to civilian life. And on behalf of our uh, Dominion President, Comrade Dave Flanagan, I want to thank the Spotlight Project for inviting us here today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ray. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Fordos, and I'm the National Director of Public Policy of the Canadian Mental Health Association. And first, I'd like to thank the Canadian Heart of Hearing Association for hosting this event and setting up this wonderful event for us all to get together and have these discussions. Second, I'd like to thank the panelists here who understand that the definition of accessibility needs to go beyond visible disabilities, and we have to include invisible disabilities. And third, I want to thank all of you here and all of you online for attending, isn't it? It's an early morning, you know, and it's tough to get up, and we all appreciate everyone that's here. So CMHA turns 100 years next year. So 2018, we celebrate our 100-year anniversary. Canada only turned 150. And we are a Canada-wide organization with over 15,000 staff and over 300 operational sites across the country. And we're usually described as the boots on the ground. You know, we do provide advocacy policy and but we do the service, and that's our branches, and that's where the majority of our work, and that's what we want to highlight is our branches. So what we also do is we facilitate access to resources uh, that people require to maintain and improve good mental health, community integration, build resilience, and support recovery from mental illness. And the reason the Spotlight Project was very important to us or why we were excited to join was because, as Lauren mentioned, we, they're, they're, they're highlighting mental health. As Ray mentioned, they're highlighting mental health. And usually with a lot of invisible disabilities, they're concurrent. So if someone has a hard of hearing so, uh, problem, they also have a mental health issue. So that's why the Spotlight Project was very important. We're so thrilled to be a part of the group and to see our recommendations come to fruition. So thank you for everyone. Thank you and good morning. My name is Jewel Smith and today I am representing NEEDS, the National Educational Association of Disabled Students as a, a member, a director on the board. Um, my colleague Tony, uh, or sorry, uh, Ainsley Latour was unable to come um, today so I am sitting here in her space but I know she's been working very hard with the Spotlight Project. Um, <clears throat> NEEDS is a national organization that uh, started in 1986, so we're just about to celebrate 31 years of um, work with students. And our mandate is to support students through many transitions, including accessing college, university, and trades, um, moving forward into employment, uh, learning how to use your skills in other ways, whether it's volunteer or other experience, and advocating on the ground for students, and um, whether at their universities or with government. Um, we have a really amazing website that, um, if you don't know about it, needs.ca has a lot of tools and resources. Uh, we've done a couple decades of work on issues that students face in accessing employment, and it's very exciting to be part of um, a group that's looking at invisible disabilities because it's an area we've identified that is one of the hardest to support uh, these transitions in. Um, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. My name is Maureen Hahn. I am the President and CEO of the Canadian Council on Rehabilitation and Work, also known as CCRW. CCRW is in our 41st year now, um, and we are a national organization with the sole mandate of employment for people with disabilities. 
We do that working with two partners. We work with people with disabilities, and we work with employers. Um, we know that the only way people are actually going to get into the workforce is by shifting the landscape of Canada and employment area of uh, in the employment area of ensuring employers are on board for hiring people with disabilities. So, and the reason we are uh, very excited about being involved with the Spotlight Project is because a large percentage of our clients are people with invisible disabilities. So, um, and uh, and I would say that. It depends on where we are in the in in Canada, but on average, it's about 67% of our clients are uh, people with invisible disabilities. So we're very excited to be involved with the project, and um, and uh, thank goodness phase one is over, and um, looking forward to phase two. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to each and every one of you. I know you all have busy schedules. And uh, you took the time to come out here and speak on behalf of all your members and to support Shaw in, in our ventures. So very much appreciated. So now, there were 15 recommendations that came out of the cross-country consultations that we held during Phase 1, which you'll find in the Spotlight Project Phase 1 report. The abridged version is here with you today. And you can also access the French and English full reports on our website. With much discussion, the advisory panel has combined the 15 recommendations found in the Spotlight Project Phase 1 report into five priority areas. These five areas will provide the basis for what we'll focus on in Phase 2. The five priority areas include administration, compliance, and standards. This is around setting up uh, an NGO, a governing organization, to administer government funding and ensure compliance. Another is employment. Here we're aiming to improve employment search and retention practices for those with invisible disabilities. And then there's technology and accessing information and communications. And this is about enhancing accessibility to new technologies, as well as establi establishing clear and varied modes of communication. Again, we're also focusing on barrier-free access. So this would be to transportation, to built environment, program delivery and service, and, very, uh, and services, and goods and services. And lastly, uh, public education to expand understanding and acceptance of those with invisible disabilities. Today, in the interest of time, of course, we'd love to cover all of those, but we will be focusing on two uh, areas. And so we're going to be talking about employment and technology and what practices the federal government could put in place to address the gaps found in these areas. So let's start uh, with employment. So here's the first question for our panelists. So for your members, what would addressing employment look like in practice? And what does the federal government need to put in place to make this happen, both in the short and the long term? Our challenge here today is to keep our answers really concrete <laughs> and concise. Uh, and we can go beyond simply saying that we need more funding. Uh, let's also talk about what small changes the federal government could make that could lead to bigger changes. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to lead this with uh, Lauren, actually. I'm starting with Lauren. And I'm going to ask you to keep your, your answers to three to four minutes apiece. And, uh, yeah. Oh, thanks, Lauren. Um, with that, I think what I'll do is, if Maureen is agreeable, um, if she could start, because she's the employment-focused person, and then uh, I can respond, because I don't want to, to uh, replicate what you might say. Come on. <laughs> So um, first of all, I think that it's important to note that uh, uh, all of 
our stakeholders at CCRW are very excited to see this legislation come to fruition and, um, and that this recommendation of focusing on employment uh, is, is made. I think that that's fantastic. And um, as we said early, as I said earlier, we at CCRW work with both job seekers with disabilities and employers. And it's uh, the employers that we work with are employers who are already <coughs> employing people with disabilities and those who don't employ people with disabilities. And the people who don't employ people with disabilities really needs to be our focus. Um, uh, we are hoping that the government legislation um, will focus on uh, successful hires, but also retention of people with disabilities, and specifically for the Spotlight Project, of course, invisible disabilities. And the only way that that can happen is to look through both lenses. Um, what the community of people with disabilities requires for employment, and also what employers need to make sure this happens. And um, we did a, a little survey. We're in the middle of doing a survey, and I can give you a quick little um, inside scoop. Um, so we have uh, surveyed um, around 45 employers, and uh, the majority of these are small to medium-sized businesses. And uh, with uh, actually 62% are, are small businesses, and uh, that means less than 50 people working with them. And when we asked those employers, why did you hire a person with a disability, uh, the 64% uh, came back and said, I'm an employer who likes to give everyone a chance. 88% said, hiring people with disabilities aligns with our business goals of, or, or mission of being an inclusive employer, and that we hire staff to represent our clientele and people with disabilities are our clientele. And I think using that, that sort of insight um, for, uh, for um, the legislation coming forward is very, very important to understand what motivates employers for hiring, and these are employers who are hiring people with disabilities. So I think that um, the uh, uh, specific supports, such as a national accommodation fund, um, in, that includes adaptive devices, uh, creating a harmonized approach for removing barriers to employment through streamlining policies and laws is extremely important. Right now, Canada has um, uh, Employment Equity Act. We are members of the Convention of Rights for Persons with Disabilities, and we have this legislation that's coming out. All of those, all of those laws and policies need to be streamlined so that uh, we are ensuring success as opposed to hiding behind, um, oh, well, that law doesn't say this or this policy is in conflict. Um, and uh, I think uh, as well, tax benefits to employers who accommodate uh, staff with disabilities is one of the right approaches to take. And to support the employers to hire and retain people with disabilities and invisible disabilities, short-term wins include uh, ensuring procur procurement policies that focus on equitable suppliers, uh, research on wage subsidies, and other employer incentives to measure their effectiveness. When we asked our little uh, survey of employers, uh, we, were, we were told that, um, we, we asked, do you think that incentives help employers hire people with disabilities? And 100% of the respondents came back and said yes. And incentives can include things like, I'm almost done, <laughs> things like wage subsidies, uh, job coaching, um, uh, uh, um, oh, I'm losing it, oh, um, and also support from, support from agencies. So thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Thanks for keeping on the time. Yeah, I, I heard. Oh. <laughs> it wasn't meant to be heard, but no, that's, that's okay. Good. I like it. Uh, Jules, I'm going to pass it on to you. We're going to start from that end now. Okay. So um, some of the things that um, students with disabilities who are ex exiting university are um, what we've learned from needs. Um, students who don't, um, I'm just going to quote Dr. Um, 
Mahadi Sukai and Chelsea Moeller, um, we found students who encounter barriers during their transition may experience downward mobility. So more often than not, um, if students uh, with disabilities are exiting grad school or, or their undergrad and they don't keep up with their peers entering the workforce, there is an immediate impact on their financial situation and on their health. And it's really important that we ensure that any policy supports these transition periods. Um, another finding that uh, I think is really critical is um, we've discovered uh, about one in two university graduate students, disabled or not, um, finds professional work. However, if you have a disability, the chances of you entering into positions of, um, of leadership or management are almost non-existent. And I don't understand that statistic. The people that I know who come out of university with disabilities are some of the smartest people I know who can juggle a lot of things. They, they understand people. They understand how to find solutions. So things like that, the government really needs to look at and figure out ways to support employers to move and transition students with disabilities through these um, stages of their career. Um, Another challenge I think that we really need to address, and I think it can be addressed through education, is what um, Dr. Sukai has termed the gatekeeper function. And this is the idea that more often than not, professors and work counselors and school counselors are telling people with disabilities what kind of jobs they should go for. They'll say, oh, you should, you know, that's going to be too hard for you. Maybe you should go into, you know, stocking shelves or or maybe if you have dyslexia, you should just, maybe you should fix cars. Not being creative and understanding, people might be passionate about something completely different. And finding solutions to support those passions will create better workers in our system. Um, I think more of my answers are going to be for part two, but those are just a couple of things that needs are, is concerned with. Thank you. Thank you, Jules. I'm going to pass it on to Fardos now. Thanks. Uh, I think it's important to set some context as well. So. Although there's a general social trend toward inclusivity, there's still a number of barriers that hinder the full integration acceptance of people with mental illness in contemporary society. And those barriers include but are not limited to that the public misconception or belief that persons with disabilities may not be able to perform job functions and thus negatively impinge on productivity, or the negative attitude towards the cost and social dislocation related to disability accommodation. And that stat that Jules just mentioned is alarming because these stigmas are difficult to overcome, but research shows time after time that individuals with disabilities are as qualified, if not more qualified, reliable, safe, loyal, and high performing than their colleagues who do not have mental illness. So I could quote eight or nine articles, peer reviewed journal articles that show that research shows that those people are even more qualified than the other colleagues. So eliminating, eliminating employment barriers for individuals living with a mental illness requires a multifaceted approach. And so some key recommendations include rethinking the structure of disability, inc disability income support policies and programs. So currently the disability income supports, it's not really designed with mental illness in mind and it doesn't work well for people with mental illness. So many people that have, many programs that are currently available have strict lines between who can work and those who cannot work, and don't provide space for those with intermittent workability, where mental illness usually lies because it's very episodic in conditions, right? So even the disability tax credit, that means uh, a great deal to people with marginal incomes, many people can't obtain it because of the language and the difficulty and the interpretation of it. Doc patients or individuals with mental illness will go to their doctors, the doctors will look at it, and it's really a difficult form to fill out, and they'll say, oh, this is not something I do although it is something they should do. So that's one thing that they should be able to change the language and simplify it a bit. And on top of those, those who do receive disability benefits uh, have told us that the fear of losing the disability benef benefits is one of the reasons, one of the barriers to obtaining and maintaining employment for clients. is because they can't do both with the current system and that's something that we need to change is they don't have to have that fear. If they, do, if they are getting disability income supports, they should also be able to work. And to address the challenges of people with mental illness, the federal government needs to create a disability income support systems that are flexible and individualized in order to allow people with ser serious mental illness the opportunity to participate in the labor market. 
So from a policy perspective, everyone has mentioned on here, that's what we have to change. Another important recommendation I'll try to go through quickly, there's a lot I can speak to about employment, but is to help search and retention practices get better is to ensure that employment support programs have the capacity and skills to appropriately address the needs of individuals in men with mental illness. Uh, so from a skills development lens, it's important that all Canadians living with a serious mental illness that are seeking employment should have access to programs that help them develop the skills necessary to obtain and retain meaningful employment. And one of the programs that comes to mind is resilience, you know, and CMHA across the country has those programs available. And the way to do this is to encourage employment providers to partner with community stakeholders like us and help them develop evidence-based programs together and not work in silos, work collaboratively, and that's the best way we can come up with programs. And another thing just quickly is that although we've done a great job of reducing stigma in the last few years, you know, that stigma is still real. You know, and a lot of people will tell you at work, they'll go through little episodes, you know, and then they can't come out because of the stigma. So we have to create education awareness campaigns at the work level where employers and HR get together and make people aware of the stigma associated with it so people have, feel comfortable to come out. Thank you. Thank you, Fardos. I'm going to... Pass it on to you, Ray. Well, we're a bit spoiled, I guess, in the veteran community. Budget 2017 addressed uh, the Career Transition Services Program. So uh, Veterans Affairs Canada is redesigning the program so to ensure that veterans, reservists, survivors, spouses, and common law partners become more employable. This will ensure that these individuals will have the knowledge, skills, and abilities required to search for employment in the civilian workforce so they are more likely to gain employment and feel satisfaction for their employment. The benefits of this approach include an expansion of current uh, eligibilities, the removal of time limits for veterans, reservists and survivors to uh, access benefits, and simplification or elimination of the application process for participants. It's huge. This means that career transition service benefits would be available more readily. The services received would be relevant, consistent, and provided by qualified career counselors who have an understanding of military life and culture. And services would remain accessible during their working years, meaning the employment outcomes of participants would be expected to improve over the longer term. Now, this benefit was announced for Budget 2017. The Treasury Board hasn't approved the funding yet, so we're waiting anxiously for that. Uh, but the benefit itself should come into effect in 1 April 2018. But just to go on uh, uh, along more with what uh, Fardos uh, said, it is really time to dissolve the stigma that surrounds mental illness and ensure that not only can Canadian veterans but Canadian public can seek help without fear of reprisal and get the help they need when they need it, for as long as they need it, and no matter where they reside in Canada. Ensure that federal employees receive training and education to communicate effectively with people living with mental health and invisible disabilities. That's it. Thank you, Ray. I'm going to... Lauren, it's your turn. Yeah, thank you. I've had the benefit of, of appearing last. That was intentional, so I could hear what everyone had to say before I rounded it up. Um, I just have four comments. The, the first is that we've heard some numbers that are rather alarming. And I think that we need to encourage the federal government to do that data collection. Because what gets measured gets done. And so until we have a clear picture of what the numbers are of Canadians living with invisible disabilities, we're going to be hard pressed to get the policies that we need to address those, those numbers because the, the data will inform the policy development. And so specific to the Canadian Hard of Hearing Association, um, another point is the disability tax credit. We are aware that it is very restrictive for a lot of Canadians living with hearing loss. So we need to see how we can advocate more effectively to get those changes to happen. Uh, next, I consider that the preparation for employment is a key piece. That within our community, we need to prepare 
everyone who is seeking employment to understand what it means to be accommodated, what accommodation um, can be provided, how to effectively self-advocate, how to do everything. Do you disclose um, in your uh, employment application that you have a hearing loss? How do you handle that interview? How do you get through that door? And that's a really, really key piece. And then once you're through the door, the employers need to understand that we are not cookie cutter. Um, we can have two people with the same audio audiology of hearing loss, but have very different needs. And one may rely on sign language interpretation, the other may rely on captioning. And both of them are valid. There's no, if you are um, a person who lives with hearing loss, this is how we accommodate you. It's not as simple as if you are a wheelchair user, we have a ramp. We need to be flexible and employers need to appreciate that. And also the last piece is the retention part of it that Maureen alluded to is that it's fine to do the recruitment, it's fine to do the hiring, but are you committed to keeping uh, Canadians who have hearing loss in the workforce? What does that look like? Well, in my view, it looks like a safe place. Do you have a safe place for your employees to go where they can talk about um, any accommodation issues they have and feel confident that their needs will be met. Because oftentimes I find that safe place is not there. Where do you go? Does the person actually have training in how to accommodate? Can the conversation be a two-way conversation instead of a one-way, this is what we are prepared to do? No, it needs to be a dialogue. And with that, the, the workforce only gets better when there is a wide range of abilities within. We've seen that happening with the increase of women. Um, we've seen that happen with the increase of our, our racialized uh, community members. And we need to see that happen with invisible disabilities as well. We are, we are stronger together. So that's my, my point. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. So let's move on now. There's lots of work to be done, obviously. Through these discussions, we can see that the government has a difficult task ahead of them, um, but that's why we're here today. So let's move on to the second priority area. So let's focus on technology. Um, let's ask the question again, so I'm just going to reiterate. What would addressing technology look like in practice? What does the federal government need to put in place to make this happen, both in the short and in the long term? So I'm, I am going to go ahead and start with Maureen at the end there and just work your way down. And if I could just ask you to just then pass on to the next uh, panelist as you finish your discussion and all. Okay. Thank you. Fabulous. Great. Thank you. So um, technology, um, I have to uh, preface that by saying that I'm going to be speaking about this through the lens of employment. Um, I know that we just finished talking about employment, but, um, but uh, technology at work. Um, is a very important aspect to, um, to this recommendation, I believe. Um, so uh, I think that um, the impact of this change will be extremely strong if it's coordinated properly. Uh, I believe that that's the intention of the federal government, and um, I think that we just need to make sure that that's, uh, that, that that's the outcome, as Lauren was talking about earlier. Um, again, back to uh, my little survey of, uh, of employers and, and, and reaching back to a, a lot of the things that um, the panelists were talking about. When we asked employers why people are not hiring people with disabilities, in their opinion, why their colleagues, why their fellow business people are not hiring people with disabilities, um, fear of the unknown and a, and a lack of awareness of the abilities of people with disabilities were the number two number one reasons they were tied at 71%. That's what business owners are telling us. If we are able to, um, to educate employers on the benefits of hiring people with disabilities through technology and ensuring that technology is easy to use, that, that the um, employers understand 
uh, what technology is out there and and also um, back to uh, um, somebody's point I'm sorry um, making sure that uh, that the users are completely able and capable of using the technology that's available to them. I think that that's uh, being your own self-advocate is an extremely important uh, role within um, within successful successful hiring and retention. And um, technology today is much different than it was 10 years ago. It will be much different in 10 years from now. So making sure that any type of legislation is fluid enough to be able to understand the changes of technology as they go forward. Thanks. Thanks, Maureen. So um, just the other, yesterday and the day before, uh, I was attending um, the Disability Resource Network conference in Vancouver, um, and Miles Stratholt, from the BC, who is a BC government policy analyst, um, gave a presentation that was focused on technology and um, accessibility, and talking about this transition from university or other, other spaces, high school, whatever, into employment, and some of the challenges um, that are experienced by people trying to find employment. Um, a couple of, he brought up a lot of really great points. Um, he did bring, bring up that solutions are often unique, as um, I believe Lauren said. Every person will require something different slightly, and technology from year to year changes now. And so those updates are really critical so that people who are using technology have access to whatever is the latest and the best because that makes them a better employee. Some issues that students are finding um, is, are things like the time limits placed on how long you're, um, you can access funds through your education. So a student with a disability, especially an episodic disability, might take longer to complete. And so by the, nearing the end of their education, they don't have access to the grants that pay for the technology that they need. In British Columbia, we have um, an organization called Assistive Technology BC, which can give loans and support us here but that is unique in the country, and I think that we need to look at programs that are effective like ATBC, and then um, try to launch that throughout the province and extend past just education to um, the workforce, because the costs shouldn't be a barrier for students and for those of seeking employment. Um, and another really critical point is the, uh, the point of how to use that technology. Too often, um, if you don't have an organization attached to that access, you don't fully learn how to use the technology, and then it's a waste of money, and the person might not be successful in that employment or educational situation. So again, having organizations that are able to uh, support the learning process of, of assistive technology, and also support when updates occur. I can tell you for sure, I use Dragon Naturally Speaking. Every time Office updates, my program stops working effectively for me. And so the support I have from ATBC is critical in my ability to continue moving forward with my education. Um, other issues include uh, restrictions on age. So a lot of times we hear of programs that are up till 30 years old or whatever, but some of us are a little older and it's taken us longer because of times of, of not being well and not being able to work. And as well, women often take time off to raise their children. And this can be a really, you know, they can lose time and end up trying to pursue their education and, and further employment in their 40s and they don't qualify for many of the programs. Um, one final point as well is the problems that exist between federal, provincial and territorial uh, policies and legislation need to be addressed. When Maureen and I and others from Canada were in Geneva at the UN, that was one of the things that the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Committee really called Canada out. We should not have restrictions on people because our federal policy and our provincial or territorial policies don't communicate well together. Thank you. Thank you, Jules. Uh, we live in a technological era. Error, error. <laughs> Sorry. Error? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is an error. Yeah. <laughs> because of the shortcomings. <laughs> But <laughs> I agree. <laughs> um, but for mental health, currently there's there's no ecosystem for technology. But we are looking at it from a e mental health and apps. Every uh, almost every person has a cell phone or they have some sort of connection. And there's no real apps. It's not no one is really regulating that field. But we are looking into it because if we do find something, we can help youth transitioning from high school to university. Because all 
kids have a cell phone, you know, and then there's access to this. So it would be very helpful if the work we are doing through the Spotlight Project, if we could currently fund projects that will fund e-mental health apps, you know, and that's a big piece that we are trying to work on. It's fairly new, so there's not much to update on that. But one of our flagship programs that CMHA offers is Bounce Back, and it's over the phone coaching for mild to moderate depression, and it's shown to be very effective, and technology also includes phone conversations. So I don't want to touch on funding, but if we could fund programs like that where people in rural parts of Canada who don't have access to a psychologist or psychiatrist who can get coaching over the phone, that would be very helpful and we can get to as many people as, as possible. So from technology, that's all I really have. You know, from, I can talk about communication if we want to talk about communication a little bit, you know, and that touches on stigma again, you know, the, the, the words that we use you know, to describe mental illnesses, you know, it's, it's very damaging and we have to change that, you know, from a technological perspective, if you go to a public office, some of the employers aren't trained, and people with invisible disabilities you don't know, and you're talking to them to a certain way, you know, it's inappropriate. And it, that, it just, that just adds to the stigma. And even on TV, if you're watching something, the words that they use, like committing suicide, that suicide's not a crime, it's a public health concern, you're not committing a crime someone dies by suicide. So we have to change the language, you know, and that's very important to help eliminate stigma. Okay. I'll be uh, very brief with this one. Uh, I already mentioned that we provide benevolent funding to buy hearing aids for our veterans in financial uh, need. So what we'd, uh, I, I fully support the recommendation uh, going forward that this country have a national assistive devices program to cover at least 80% of the price, uh, mm -hmm. the, the, yeah, the price for assistive uh, technical devices. In Ontario, we're a little spoiled. We get $1,000 off ADP for hearing aids. Not all provinces do that, I believe. Uh, and hearing aids, as you know, are quite expensive. So if the government nationally came out and provided that type of funding, uh, we'd be farther ahead, better off and we can use our money for uh, other uh, requirements. Uh, on e-mental health, and again, we're a little spoiled veteran community because we do have a contract with Health Canada where we provide uh, e-mental health across the country, and there are apps uh, already ongoing. And uh, over a year ago, we provided a million dollars to the Royal Ottawa Hospital in, uh, to buy a PET MRI machine. Uh, We'll see the research out of that machine in about five years' time, but we're just trying to not only eradicate the stigma around mental illness, but we want to find uh, ways of uh, not just going through a prescribing medications and then prescribing more medications. So if we can find out how we can uh, support people suffering mental illness quicker and treating them quicker, that will be, uh, that will be uh, well, Canada will be leading, uh, leading the uh, the world on that. So that's about it for technology and you have the floor. <laughs> I think when it comes to technology, we have to go further back, <clears throat> excuse me, with encouraging the federal government to step up their research and development because we should be a leader in this regard. And while there's very good work happening, I don't think we're at that place yet. Um, and as Jewel mentioned, being called out as a country by the UN is not a good thing. And so people expect more from us. And I think if the federal government has that funding in place for more research and development mm -hmm. to create that technology or improve upon it. And we've all heard um, there's an app for that. Um, that's what the, what the kids say, and it's funny when you hear a uh, reference to the kids, we're all old. <laughs> but we have a lot of respect for the younger generation that has grown up with computers and with cell phones and all of that, because I know myself, I can recall always getting lost or not connecting with my friends because I didn't hear something right on the phone. And now I've got a GPS on my phone and I, I can text, and we need to improve upon that. And also phone support, excellent. I'm a big fan of the live chat features. I think all of the federal government uh, websites as well as the connections with the MPs. We have to keep in mind this is federal accessibility legislation. 
it would be extremely helpful because it can be a real barrier to um, Canadians living with hearing loss who need to find answers and there's only um, a phone number that's provided or a TTY that may not be appropriate and we have to do better because the information needs to come out to people and also the big challenge with with our community is the fact that whenever there's a sensory disability being vision or hearing for the most part still we have to rely on people we have a captioner present we have the sign language interpreter present and and that's just the reality i have people say well can't you do what YouTube does and um, get the, the captioning that way? I commend to you any YouTube video that you may find that has the auto-generated captioning and tell me how it works for you. And we should not have to compromise our access to communication based on dollars. That's not appropriate. We need to level the playing field for Canadian to have hearing loss, in my view, to make sure that we get the information in. You've also heard the computer term, garbage in, garbage out. So if we're not hearing the, properly in the first place, our response is not going to be appropriate to what has been said. So that is, is a very critical piece of it. And also the, the training needs to happen with employers again to understand that not everyone with a hearing loss requires the exact same accommodation. As I said, I'm pleased to see we have a sign language interpreter here today. We also have captioning. However way you need your communication, that should not be an issue at all. It's about getting that effective communication and we need to do that, that training. So that, that, those are my few points. Thank you very much to all of you. Lots of practical information that we can then deliver to the government and uh, let them grapple with that and figure it out. Uh, so we've talked a lot about the practicalities of how the federal government could address these challenges around employment and technology. Uh, but before I open the floor to uh, your questions, uh, I want to take a minute to reflect on the real-life impact that these recommendations would have if implemented. If these recommendations and the changes you suggested were put in practice by the federal government, what would the impact be for your members? What potential change in accessibility would implementing these recommendations lead to? I think what we're looking for is measuring success. What is the bottom line? So I'll start with Maureen. Okay. Great. So I think that um, with these changes, uh, we would have a better workforce. I think that um, employers would recognize that we have um, uh, a unique talent pool of people with disabilities, including invisible disabilities, and a different way to work. Um, and I think that um, uh, that needs to happen through education for employers. Um, I, again, I don't believe that we're going to shift anything if we don't get employers on board. And, I, and so I really do look to the federal government to um, ensure that, that the education for employers is, is, is critically important when it, comes to, um, when it comes to employment. And I also just want to, um, to, to add that in our little employer survey, yeah, um, we asked again, uh, why did you hire someone with a disability? 50% came back and said that the applicants met their business needs. So it's not pity hiring. And, and um, when realized after you know, hiring somebody with a disability that, wow, my workforce does become more diverse. My workforce does become more innovative. That's the, that's the key message that I think needs to be um, um, brought back. Thanks, Maureen. So some of the ways I think that um, addressing the concerns that have been raised uh, in practical um, 
steps would support, I think we would create, as Marie mentioned, a more diverse society. But I also think that whenever um, a younger person sees a role model out there working, somebody who has a similar disability or diagnosis or challenge or using accessible um, assistive technology of some kind, it makes them have better vision of what is possible in their life. And I think that's really critical. If you don't, <clears throat> if you don't see yourself out there, it's really hard to imagine how you can fit in. Um, I also think that this will have, you know, change people's standards of living. If you are able to enter the workforce and you don't need to rely on pensions from governments, you have a much better standard of living, you have better mental health, you have better peer groups. I think the impact is profound. I know people who have completed their university degree, been unable to get work, and they are spiraling into depression, and this needs to stop. And overall, I just, I just think it's really important that we look at the population of people that are impacted when legislation restricts us. Thanks. Thank you. As Maureen said, uh, we'd create a better workforce, you know, if we have more diverse and inclusive people in the workforce. That's, that's the ultimate thing that we will see and it's the ultimate goal that we want to achieve. And one of, an example I could provide is out of Halifax, Nova Scotia. We just I was just recently at a Champions Gala for Mental Health and Stoneheart Bakery in Nova Scotia who hires and trains people with mental illness over 19 years of age and then they get into the workforce and they, it's all people with, that are recovering. And what they were really successful in was not that they were able to hire those people but they make the best bread in Nova Scotia. <laughs> and they won awards for that which shows that people with disabilities are better or more qualified than their other colleagues. You know, so we have to change that lens and reduce that stigma. And as Jewel said, is people have to be able to see that recovery is possible and the beauty of recovery, you know. And I had the privilege of working at Renison, which is an addiction treatment center in Toronto, where the frontline councils are all in active recovery. And I have never seen more hard working people in my life. You know, and the, the highlight that the glow that they bring is it's contagious, you know, and that if people can see that and they can see it in other people, they'll go out there and try to obtain jobs, you know, and that's that's what we have to focus on the beauty of recovery. Yeah, there's not uh, too much more I can add to uh, what was just said, but people with invisible disabilities must feel satisfaction as well with their employment and we will have a better workforce but we got to get the laws changed. Yeah. Um, I think the, the federal government, I'm sure, is aware, but this is an investment. It's an investment in our country to get Canadians who have invisible disabilities working because they, in turn, become taxpayers and, in turn, end up funding um, the, the program. But we need that hand up, not a hand out, it doesn't work. We've all seen the, the studies done and such. If we decrease those on the welfare rolls by finding meaningful, meaningful employment, it makes a significant difference. So that's the investment piece. And aside from agreeing with my colleagues about an inclusive Canada is a stronger, better Canada, there's another piece to it. Those of us who have invisible disabilities we're no stranger to what it feels like to have discrimination uh, leveled up at us all the time. The, the sting of, of attacks based on misconceptions um, that are false, not appropriate, and do not advance the spirit of collaboration. We are better than that. And I would think those of us, your respective communities, that have uh, people with invisible disabilities, we know what it feels like to have that um, leveled at us all the time and try to negotiate. And I believe, personally, that that makes us far more compassionate and empathic, that through our personal experience, we, in turn, are more compassionate to the people that we work with 
and are more understanding and are more kind. That's what I believe the community of Cha is about. We've often said that being at a Cha conference is a safe place because you're among friends who understand. And I think across Canada, we can build that for all invisible disability to create that stronger workplace, stronger um, space, wherever you may be in Canada. And the government, by placing that investment in its citizens to ensure full participation, it's a win-win all the way around. Thank you. Thanks again, everybody. So we've heard from our advisory committee of the Spotlight Project, uh, and who they stand for, what they represent, and their recommendations within these two priority areas. Um, as I mentioned earlier in phase one, we've asked for your feedback on what challenges you're facing. Now in phase two, we'd like to discuss how the federal government can directly bridge gaps relating to accessibility, identifying concrete recommendations for implementation is the focus of phase two. So on that note, uh, we welcome questions around what you've heard here today from our panelists. As well, it would be great to hear about what concrete change or practice the federal government could implement that would change accessibility for you. I'd ask that you keep your comments and questions short to allow for everybody to have an opportunity as to participate in the discussion. So I'll keep the conversation moving and signal time. Um, and by, I'll lift up my script maybe and, and that'll just give you a 30 second uh, time limit there. So, um, and a reminder to our webcast participants, we always have to remember that we have over 70 people following us online right now. So we want to hear your questions as well. So if you, those of you on the webcast, if you can enter your questions using the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen, that will be great, and we'll address your questions then. But now I open it up to the floor, and I have two individuals on the floor with microphones. So I have Leslie uh, in the left-hand side of me here, and I have Rayanne that will look after the right-hand side. And Leslie, I see a question there in the back row. If we want to start there, that would be great. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Levi. I'm the president of Chaw Hamilton. Um, thank you to the panelists for the information provided. Um, the one question is regarding employment. Um, and and I, uh, um, we had a, a speaker at Chaw Hamilton in one of our meetings. Um, that came down and actually presented to us. Uh, the gentleman's name is Mark Wafer, and he owns seven Tim Hortons. And uh, he's a proponent in hiring disabled people. And, and uh, he, his approach is actually showing you the business case to the employer, not to the government, but to the employer, why should they hire um, people with disabilities? And, and he put together a business case actually making it um, important to the employer to actually hire these people. Because in a field like Tim Hortons where the turnover is nine months to two years, um, he's got employees at 15 years plus um, that he's employing. So as a panel, um, what are we doing? I know one, one prong is to go after the government and get funding and, and put the legislation in place. But the second is go after the businesses and show them um, directly of why it's important and, and why it's beneficial to actually hire uh, people with disabilities. Thanks. Does anybody have a comment on, on that or want to address that? Maureen? So uh, thank you very much for your question, Levi. I think that it's a very important, uh, it's a very, very important Point. And um, at CCRW, that's why we say we have two groups of clients. We have people with disabilities and we have employers because we have to work with employers to make sure that employers understand the benefits to hiring a person with a disability and not that it's a pity hire. Lauren said it. It's not a handout, it's a hand up. And, um, and understanding that innovation 
comes uh, when hiring people with disabilities. And I know um, uh, I, I had a conversation with a woman. I fly a lot for, uh, for my work. And I had a conversation with a woman who worked at NAV Canada who said to me, there's no way we can hire a person with a disability. There's no way. And fair enough, fair enough. But let's just talk about what it is that you need at NAV Canada. What is it that you want? And she said, I need a linear thinker, somebody who's going to think 18 steps in advance, but straight. Right? You know, a person in a wheelchair gets on a plane, knows exactly where their hotel is, knows their backup hotel and the backup hotel to that, has two taxi, taxi uh, companies in their pocket to know in case their accessible van doesn't show up as it was supposed to. So if we're talking about linear thinking, we have to think about the people who have linear thinking all the time. And that's just one example. But figuring out what it is that, um, um, what it is in our daily lives of people with disabilities, what it is that we deal with on a daily basis that can actually help an employer get their job done because employers are not in the business of hiring people with disabilities. Employers are in the business of making widgets or whatever their business is. We have to realize that it's not up to them to hire people with disabilities. It's, us to, it's up to us to figure out what our talents are and make sure that they understand what those talents are. Absolutely. Yeah, Jules, go ahead. So one of, um, one of the things that I've um, discussed often with students who are going through professional programs is how, how can we make it possible, A, that they get those internships in their professional programs, but B, how about the people that are going through those programs who are future employers? How can we make sure that the conversation is had during their education about what a strength their company will have if they hire people with diverse abilities? And I also really think it's important to start talking about accessibility. And so when employers are hiring, let, let's encourage them to ask, what is it that, that I can do as an employer to make your job go better? What do you need for accessibility? And that can include even just parents. Well, my daycare closes at 4 p.m. So I could start earlier, but I need to be home by 4 p.m. But it also might mean that I need Dragon Naturally Speaking in order to get the reports done in a timely manner. So I think it's about having that conversation with our future employers as they move through the education process is critical. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Did you want to address yeah. that? Just a very, very quick comment. Um, with employers, they need to understand that doing something differently doesn't mean doing it not as well. And, and sometimes employers can get thrown off if uh, an employee or a potential employee needs accommodation to do what someone without a disability would do. And the perception is that that work cannot be done as well. And I don't believe that's true at all. <laughs> sure, Fardos, go ahead. Just to make a business case using stats, uh, of the 2.5 million working age Canadians with a disability, 795,000 are unemployed, even though they're willing to work. And by 2031, the Canadian Chamber of Commerce tells us that they estimate they'll, be ex they'll experience significant labor market shortage up to about 2, million, 2 million people, which will cost the country billions in GDP loss. And we have aspiring workers who are willing to work, who are as capable, and they're, gonna, they're perfect for the solution. You know, so let's implement them, and it's a win-win for everyone. Win for Canada, and it's not a hand-me-down, it's a hand-me-up, right? Great. Now, I did see somebody's hand up on this side. Uh, Rayanne, could you get this um, lovely lady in the second row here? That would be great. Thank, Thank you. you. My name is Lynn Whedon, member of uh, Chaw Calgary. I think this is um, a most informative sentence session, but one of the things that I think could be pointed out is the need for a budget. If we're going to be accommodating the, those with disabilities, especially the invisible disabilities, you can't go up to an employer and uh, 
this is what I need an FM system, for example, for, for the board meetings. The, but that need has to be put in a budget. And so the, in the, the employer goes, I haven't got that in my budget. And I think that we need to be proactive there. Is there some way you can get information out, especially to new businesses when they are starting up to give this a regard and what is needed? Thank you. Does anybody want to address that, Lauren? No? I have just one. Yeah, Jules, go ahead, please. I think that that's really important having that budget but an actual uh, policy change that could make is the idea that um, so I, I, I had a job previously where the employer invested in what I needed to make my workspace accessible and then when my job wrapped up there all that equipment stayed behind and I think that's really ridiculous if this were funded under government budget and, and accessible technology was attached to the individual and followed it, that person, throughout their career and was updated as necessary, it would take the weight off of employers. And I just remember thinking when I left that office that all this amazing equipment that was perfect for me was just going to go in a storage room. Yeah. Really good point there, Jules. Uh, oh, Leslie, the gentleman in the far corner, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank the panel. Your presentation was very interesting and I learned a lot. However, I was a little bit surprised that nobody mentioned a very important and I believe critical factor, and that is cultural. Um, in my case, I am a hard of hearing person and I know and I am aware of stigma. I'm also aware of something very important, that when I don't understand something, the two people are handicapped, the person who's trying to communicate with me and I myself. And that creates a lot of psychological stress. And because of that stress, stigma develops. And believe me, it does develop. And I believe that when we are thinking of what can legislation do, fine, legislation can set up rules. But the way these rules are going to be applied will very much depend on how people feel, how people see, uh, and how people actually follow what the rules say. And I believe that this is actually a critical factor when it comes to the federal government. As long as they run telephone service, they are disenfranchising me. As long as they distribute material on their website that identifies disabilities in a certain context, they are not reaching out. As long as many federal employees apply the rules but are clearly irritated when I tell them on the phone, I don't understand what you are saying. There is a problem. So how to approach it, I don't know. But I believe education, a change of attitudes by the government itself, and emphasizing that we are changing our attitude. We are emphasizing that you have to look at it on a personal, individual, uh, cultural level would really mean fundamental changes. All these other things do not matter as much as a change in attitudes. Yeah, you're absolutely right with that. And I have Lauren here that's prepared to, to yeah. speak to that. Yeah, good morning, Dr. Laszlo. Thank you for your comment. I know that uh, the federal minister for sport and persons with disabilities is very quick to say we haven't got it right at this level and very quick to also acknowledge that there needs to be a cultural shift. She understands that, but she is just one person within a full cabinet 
And, but I believe that we have a government presently at the federal level who is trying very hard to engage with Canadians to help them get it right. But like any large bureaucracy, this isn't going to happen overnight. And we'll hear more as uh, we get more into phase two and we see what the federal government comes up with. But the cultural aspect, I think the reason why none of us mentioned it is because it's just a given for us and, and it, it's not the elephant in the room. It's something we know needs to happen. So as a result, we don't even articulate it because it's just uh, a, a no-brainer as far as we're concerned. And speaking for myself, not for others, but I think everyone's agreeing. And so I, I like to give the federal government a chance to make those things happen. The minister is well aware that there are things happening across different departments that are not as accessible as they could be. Um, but trying to align all those departments is a feat in itself. And, but I feel very um, hopeful, and I think those of us who have attended the consultations across the country have been impressed by the listening that was happening, the thoughtful questions that were asked, the engagement, and I would like to give them that opportunity to make those suggestions to how to address the cultural shift that needs to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I just want, I have a question coming from online, so I do want to give them the opportunity as well. I will get to your, your questions. Uh, this one, uh, question, can the government lead by example and hire people with disabilities? If the government does this, the private sector will follow. Can anybody add to that? No, it's pretty much a, a statement in itself, right? So it's it's basically yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> do it. Uh, so yes, of course, for those, that individual online that asked that question or made that comment, of course, that is definitely one of the recommendations being put forward. So that is being addressed. Um, uh, Jade in, in the, the back there, Leslie. Um, I'm from uh, Calgary, Alberta, and I just was, um, I commenced the whole, like, employment, you know, getting people in the workforce, but I, I think we need to recognize that the, the younger generation coming in, as far as education and empowerment for individuals with disabilities, in encouraging them that, you know, you can go into university, you can go into the trade or the workforce in these aspects, because um, I find that you know, unless they have a really good role model or very assertive parents saying this guy is the limit, there isn't, um, I guess, a community be be between uh, teachers or professionals encouraging the um, younger generation to step into that role of advocacy or step into that role of assertiveness that they are able to get into the workforce. So I think um, there's that piece that's missing as well. Like. I commenced the whole, you know, workforce as far as you know, as a, as a person, as an adult with disabilities um, in in any field. But I think we're missing that key component of offering that access, whether it is in the school system or in in going into their health um, care and and just equal access in those areas. Um, I don't know what that looks like exactly, but um, do you mind just touching on that? Yes, please, Jules. So this is very much a passion of mine, um, is mentoring and role models. Um, and some of the work that I do around human rights monitoring includes a portion that looks at media and how people with disabilities are portrayed in media. And I don't think we often see ourselves in our television shows, represented on our news anchors, or in general, we just don't see ourselves in these places. And I think that's a place, an area that we can put some pressure on the government to step up and ensure that there's a diverse population um, shows up in our media, that we have speakers that are able to come to high schools <coughs> and meet with students, that we um, support artists and activists who are role models with diverse disabilities and so that students can see themselves and they can see what it might look like to have a career in many different areas, whether 
um, you know, I have a real passion for the arts, but also, you know, not, I mean, working at Tim Hortons is wonderful, but also there's lots of people that want to work in business and they don't see themselves in business or um, working in human rights like I do. So um, I think we all need to take the time to make sure that we're modeling to our communities, that we're out there in some capacity. And I know it's easy when you have an in invisible disability that sometimes it's more difficult to step up and just say, you know, I'm, I also struggle with that. But those opportunities might make a real difference for your, our younger people who are considering higher education. Thank you. Lauren. Yeah. And I'll just add to what Jewel has said, is that I think it's really critical that people with disabilities are on those committees in the community, on those volunteer associations, at those government meetings, have a voice at the table so that policy or changes in the community or what have you are made with us in mind and that disability accommodations and, and what have you are often an afterthought. Oh, I'm sorry, we never thought to do whatever it might be. And it is so much more expensive to go backward to retrofit or make that accommodation than it is to actually build it into your conference planning. Do you have that budget available for accessibility, for accommodation, whether or not it may be needed? And do you have that voice at the table who is uh, advising you? And my big thing has always been is that the whole diversity and inclusion piece for many times does not include people who have disabilities. It's very much LGBTQ, the indigenous population, racialized groups, uh, women, francophone, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes they might tack on people who have disabilities, and that needs to stop. I've said for a long time that we are truly the last frontier when it comes to civil rights. Somehow it's still acceptable to do the things that are done. Um, within our community and, and to our community to prevent us from active participation. So it really is going to be for the younger people it to start early. Get on those committees, get on those boards, get involved, get involved with, with our association, whichever association that you have with needs and, and what have you, because your voices are valuable. Your voices need to be heard. Thank you. Yeah, great. Oh, Bardos, go ahead. Just keep it brief. The saying that comes to mind is nothing about us without us. And the programs that work, the youth programs that work, are the ones with youth champions in them. And especially in the mental health field, there's stigma. But for the youth, it's even worse because when they go see a practitioner or a doctor, the way they're treated is not how they can relate to that. So you need youth to be a part of the system to help you guide correctly through it. So nothing about us without us comes to mind. And you're right, we need youth champions and we need them in all, all of our associations. Absolutely, and just to add on that, I had the pleasure yesterday to speak to a lot of the individuals that are on the Youth Adult Network through Shaw, and you are the champions, you know, so you are the trailblazers, so definitely, I just wanted to add that. Um, gentlemen, third row, middle, Rayanne, please. Hi, my name is Marin Gazda, and I'm a member of CHA Vancouver. Uh, two quick comments slash questions. On the employment issue, employers also need to be advised that once the accommodation is in place, disabled employees can and should be treated as other employees. And I mean, for example, as far as job evalu evaluation goes or, or eventual discipline, whether that they should not be afraid to tackle those issues if needed, as long as uh, everything is done properly. On technology, yes, the acquisition cost, uh, because it's usually special equipment, so it's very expensive, and uh, we know all about the cost of hearing aids. But there is also the issue of ongoing cost. For example, batteries, uh, now for most people, it's okay. For some people, it may be a burden. But uh, for, uh, we also relying more and more on technology. And uh, cell phones were mentioned. The on, uh, 
There may be a barrier in the cost of the phone itself, but then, of course, there's the issue of that Canada having some of the most expensive cell phone plans in the world. So I'm not sure if there could, should be special ways for disabled pe people or whether it's just a ge general comment on the Canadian market. Yeah, totally agree on that point for sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, let's take Bowen here in the front, Leslie, yeah. please. Thank you. Um, so my question is more about, um, and possibly a piece that we haven't touched on, is um, from my experience working with students who are in post-secondary, um, or even those who are transitioning to the workforce, um, there is um, a problem on the shortage of service providers. So um, card providers, type well, and sign language interpreters, um, because there are so many people who live in the rural areas who cannot access um, those services to go through the education, to um, participate in the workforce. So what can the federal government do to encourage um, the recruitment of qualified professionals to um, work in these areas so that we have an adequate supply of service providers um, for those who need it in order to be successful and participate um, inclusively um, in our aspects of society. Mm -hmm. Jules? <laughs> I think about this one a lot. <laughs> um, so. Frank Foligno, who is the president of um, the Canadian Deaf Association, and I have had some conversations about the sh shortage of interpreters for ASL um, and LSQ. And he strongly believes, and I support this, um, I also wear another hat, I'm chair of the Council of Canadians with Disabilities. Um, I strongly support, if we recognize ASL and LSQ as official languages, and we offer opportunities for people to um, maybe instead of taking French, they could take ASL in school and make that your second language. I think that, first of all, that's going to increase the ability to communicate in our, with, across the board in our, all of our communities. Um, I think that it's an exciting languages. Um, for myself as a visual person, I, I love ASL. I, it's, it, you know, for me, it speaks, um, I don't know, more nuance sometimes than other language. But I also think that programs where we, perhaps the government can support um, some media about these are emerging fields where you have an opportunity to build a career as a cart captioner or as an interpreter. And then we also, though, need very much to ensure that standards are in place. I understand in different provinces, you can just take one year of um, sign language interpretation and you're allowed then to become an interpreter. Um, and that's, I don't think that that's a good standard. I think we need better standards as well so that, you know, we have really strong interpreters and services. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Jules. Lauren, yeah. just to add. Oh, sorry. Oh. Maureen? No. Um, just very, very quickly, uh, I hear you about the shortage of CART service providers because I use CART a lot um, in personal as well as professional life. And I think another key issue is the fact that a lot of um, people who are trying to accommodate will hire card service providers remotely, many of whom are in the United States. And I personally have a, a, a concern with that when we're using government taxpayer dollars um, to hire people outside of our country to be the providers of the services. And I know that the card industry across Canada is dwindling because people are providing the service based on dollars only. And I don't think that's appropriate. And the government can take a stand by not engaging in that practice. Thank you, Lauren. A uh, gentleman in the back here, Leslie, please. <coughs> Hi, my name's Arthur Rendell. I've been associated with CHA for many years, held different uh, positions. Uh, I also uh, advocated for Tax 911 2007, which is now national, um, uh, what do you call it, a national safety. What uh, I come up with is uh, when I was in the employment industry, that was my focus. 
I was also the vice president of TSA, which is a division of uh, workers' compensation in Ontario. Most employers fear workers' compensations across all the perspective of employment, whether it be clerical or whether it be blue collar. What I've heard today about technology and everything else, well, okay, people go to universities, they're gonna go into mostly white collar work, they're not gonna uh, lay bricks or build roads or everything else. What we need to do is we need to do it on a federal basis, is try and convince the provinces in a workers' compensation to have some way of training employers of how to employ disabled people in a safe way which does not jeopardize their businesses. That is their biggest fear. Um, if the federal government can do that, I think you would see a vast improvement of employability in disabled people across the Canada. Thank you. I think I hear some here here's at the front. Thank you very much. Um, we're getting overwhelming questions online as well, and now I just want to reiterate that we, we wish that this was a four-hour session because everybody has a lot to share, a lot to say, and we're very passionate about uh, our standpoints. Um, with that said, we can continue. I'm just telling you, though, that I may not be able to get to all of your questions, but I do invite you for sure uh, to keep in touch with us as we move through this project. And I'm sure that our advisory committee would be happy to answer your questions even after the session is over, so you're welcome to filter those through me. So in any case, let's go move forward here. Uh, nice lady here in the front in the green sweater, please. Thank you. Um, I, I, I know a lot of what I have to say has been covered in many different ways, so I just want to try to get to the bottom line um, on a few things regarding the impact and where we can get to. First of all, I mentioned somebody said nothing about us without us. I'd like to add by saying everything is about us and everything is about everyone else as well. So that's my second point. We need to um, equip society, not just the employers, but take it further, equip everybody. That's all about awareness. Um, make everything, make the need for accommodations both invisible and visible get to the point where it's just a matter of course and it's seamless and people are aware enough to find to recognize the triggers when somebody might be struggling and it's beyond just employers it's about any public anybody who works with people public bankers just everybody in society needs to be aware. Everybody can claim a need. Everybody can claim a trauma in life. We all just need to be much more aware of all of the, everything and um, um, compassionate, as you said, and kind. And you know, we need a cultural shift in that regard as well. I have lots of other things, but I thank you. I would like to yes, find please do share those. I know a way to communicate this. Uh, in writing or however else Wonderful. beyond today. Yes. Is there any other question from the left-hand side of me here? I haven't touched upon that side of the room at all. And <laughs> how about right here, third row? Leslie, right there, thank you. Hi, I'm Kathy Pakora Fuller. So you'll hear more about me this afternoon. But I really am happy to follow the comments of the person who just spoke because I think one of the things I haven't heard, and it's really a good thing for Cha to do, is to think about, is this a black and white, you're disabled or you're not? And I don't think any of us would be happy with drawing a line that it is a continuum and there are some people who have difficulties some of the time. You spoke about the individuality. And I think this is important for government. There was the example of the Ontario ADP. I chaired the task force uh, for Ontario ADP that happened this year. And their question about who should get this funding. And they would love to have what they would refer to 
as an objective biological measure. They would love us to tell them, which we did not, that if your audiogram has this pure tone average, you get the money, and if you don't have that pure tone average, you don't get the money. But we kept telling them, and the committee was made up of consumers and professionals and various uh, ta stakeholders, we kept saying, it's not about the biological, it's about the functional. So where would you draw the line? Because somebody, when they get to those budget questions, is going to say, who's eligible? And I think the person in green who just spoke, you know, adopting a more universal approach where everybody, no matter if they have a mild loss or a profound loss, whether they've gone to a clinic yet or whether they're kind of thinking about going or whether they've had a cochlear implant since they were, you know, a few months old, are they all in your grip? There are, t Stats Canada says there's 10% of the Canadian population with a hearing <coughs> loss. Does CHA have over 3 million members yet? Okay, so I think you need to think really about that because somebody's going to be asking sooner or later. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Um, I have a question uh, online here. It's a question around accountability. Will those involved in the project stay connected to government after the recommendations are given to ensure things are implemented and funded? And certainly this is one of the other priority areas as far as compliance, uh, accountability, and obviously we hope that we're part of that uh, discussion moving forward. Just because we're entering into the second year of the project, it does not mean it ends there. We're still the ones that need to uh, work and advocate for those that we stand for. So I hope I answered that question, but anybody else want to add? Okay. Anyone else in the room? Young lady here in the front. I've been told, by the way, that I've been given a 10-minute leeway here. So, uh, you know, as long as the event coordinator doesn't come and, and cut me off here, we should be good to go for a couple more questions. Okay, thanks. Uh, my name is Marilyn, and I am from um, Cha Edmonton Branch. And this is a very interesting conversation that we're having here this morning about um, people with invisible disabilities getting into the workforce. Um, as most of us here today can attest, living with an invisible disability can be stressful, um, you know, very stressful. So I think it's fantastic that there is an emphasis on getting people with in invisible disabilities into the workplace, but I also think there needs to be a, a focus on when a person is actually in the workplace and working, um, the uh, additional stress that that puts on uh, the employee because not only do we feel, you know, we have to be working at 100%, we also feel we have to be working at 110% to ensure that, you know, we are successful in what we're doing. So I just um, wanted to ask, you know, there's an emphasis on getting people, you know, with invisible disabilities into the workplace, but what is coming after that? Like, where are their supports for them when they're there? Like, who do they go to for any issues that may arise that they're not comfortable taking up with their employer. Lauren, yeah. if you could please. Um, as I mentioned earlier, recruitment is great. Um, getting the person in the door, wonderful. But what is the retention? Where, where is that safe place within the workplace whereby um, the accommodation that's needed to ensure success is a two-way conversation. It's a dialogue, and because not all people who have invisible disabilities are up on the latest in terms of technology and accommodation uh, strategies, and nor are employers. So it shouldn't be all on us as a person with a disability. It shouldn't be all on the employer to come up with the answers. And the accommodation may change. So there needs to be that that person that's designated within the organization that has that door open for that continuing conversation because the employer benefit, the employee benefit, if that ongoing dialogue happens, the check-in points are, are going on, maybe with every performance review, how has this been working, is there something that might be better, let's figure it out together. It needs to be a truly collaborative approach 
and I think that's what is going to ensure success. I sadly think that that hasn't been emphasized strongly. I personally get quite upset when I hear about the, we'll tell you how to recruit, we'll tell you how to get the person in the door, we'll talk about retention, but we'll also let you know how to get rid of them, the firing piece. And I find that very difficult. Um, I don't think we're asking to be treated differently or better than any other employee, but there has to be a mindfulness of where people with invisible disabilities have come from in terms of employment history and how difficult it can be to be that self-advocate. doesn't come naturally for everyone. And so when you have that specter of, don't worry, we'll give you the easy way out if it doesn't work, I think that needs to be not as emphasized and it needs to be more on that retention piece. How can we make this successful so that we don't have to have that conversation down the road? Yeah, Jules, please. Sorry. So this was actually um, a discussion that was happening at the DRNBC event the other day. Um, and I. One of the things I think about a lot, I, I have a child who is in the autistic spectrum and he's 20 and he's had his first foray into the workforce and he's, he's given me permission to talk about the bumps that he's had and I think it goes back to transitions that sometimes we don't talk about. So what happened was my son was hired, he did really well, they gave him more responsibility and more responsibility and more responsibility and then he gave his two weeks notice <laughs> because he doesn't actually like to be at the front end of a business all day long, but he didn't know how to articulate that to the business, and his work person wasn't called in when he immediately gave that, even though I, like, that's, I think, the point where I wish she would have been called. She could have come in and facilitated maybe a shift. But those kinds of transitions are important, too, when your technology changes or when the job description changes, and we need to educate employers on how to facilitate those transitions we need to work with, if Work BC, for example, here in British Columbia, <clears throat> has an employment counselor working with someone who has become employed, to make sure those check-ins happen regardless of whether you get a phone call. It should just be part of the process. Check in at the first month, check in at the third month. How are things going? Are there changes? Does your technology work? Has your job description changed? I think it should all be built in with that education piece on how we support the getting the employment and retaining. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, questions? Sorry. Monty, please. Rayanne? Oh, doesn't matter, Leslie. Thank you. Um, it's, uh, my name is Monty, and uh, in my previous life, I worked for the, the uh, uh, province of BC. Um, and about, um, I would say, six, seven years ago, uh, I was talking to a representative of the uh, Minister, Ministry of uh, Advanced Education. I don't know, you know governments like to change their names, but uh, it was a, a representative in the uh, Ministry of Advanced Education. And the discussion we had was around, um, you know, how can we recruit more people uh, to take uh, interpreting, sign language interpreting, or CART. And, um, one of the things that the uh, Ministry of Advanced Education did was uh, loan forgiveness. Uh, loan forgiveness for, for those uh, who take training. Uh, at that time, it was uh, physiotherapists, uh, <clears throat> occupational therapists, and all that. So I, I, I floated the idea, you know, why don't uh, you uh, set up something for uh, those who provide services that are essential? Uh, for hard of hearing, for deaf. And she said, it, I can do that. Um, but the problem <clears throat> is that the province only covers 25% <clears throat> of the loan. And the federal government covers 75% of the loan. And, um, and uh, so, so the difficulty wasn't the province. It was the federal government because... Uh, they don't have, uh, I, I didn't know much about the federal government, but one of the recommendations should be is looking at loan forgiveness for those occupational uh, 
fields that support people like us. Thank you. Thank you, Monty. And yeah. Lauren wants um, to add to that. Just, yeah. just very yeah. quickly. Um, I think what's really key is that people need to appreciate what this proposed federal accessibility legislation can and cannot do. Um, it's not the fix all for everything in the country. There is the whole federal, provincial, territorial uh, jurisdiction, the transfer payments involved. There's, um, it, it's complicated. It truly is. So what may seem like an easy fix for us, we need to be mindful of what's going on in the background and that it's not as easy to navigate and negotiate that kind of change. But changes can happen. It may not happen as quickly as we like. It invariably never does. And um, But so it there ne also needs to be that out-of-the-box thinking because sometimes within bureaucracies, there's a, um, a love of hanging on to what has always been done and not thinking outside of the box in ways that are creative, in ways that are respectful of the suggestions that come forward. And as I said, I do have confidence that this minister is doing her best to uh, develop those collaborations across the department with her colleagues and cabinet. And, but it, it, it's not as easy as it looks and uh, we need to be mindful of what this legislation can and cannot do. Thank you, Lauren. And unfortunately, with that, I need to wrap up the session. And I know, I know there's so much to cover. Um, but this isn't the end. Phase two is continuing. And our advisory committee uh, members and their organizations are also following us through that stage. So uh, we still want you in that conversation. Uh, I invite you to email Cha with your comments or those questions that we haven't addressed, and we will uh, answer them. Or if they are comments, they are all being compiled and placed together to, uh, as recommendations to the government in our phase two report. Um, so I want to take the opportunity to thank everybody here, uh, all of our pre uh, presenters and our participants, both of course, in the room here with us, but obviously those as well that have been joining us uh, remotely. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, phase one is just uh, is wrapped up, but moving forward, uh, we're going to generate even richer content for the f federal ex towards the federal accessibility legislation. And uh, we, of course, welcome all of the participation possible. Um, and for more information uh, on the Spotlight Project, visit uh, the Canadian Heart of Hearing website. And for a list of all our partners and links to their website, you can find them as well on ours. Uh, and as well as all the recordings of our past webinars and of our session here today, it will also be accessible on our website. So I invite you to share those, that with your friends and colleagues as well. And thanks again for joining us today, and thank you again to our wonderful panel. Thank you. Join me in thanking them. Thank you.